During my recent visit to Nigeria, I met up with a wonderful and courageous woman, a dedicated mother and grandmother, a compassionate builder, a friend of God, a retired medical practitioner, top retired military personnel, the second female officer in the history of the Nigerian Army Medical to have commanded the Army Corps. <laughs> That's huge. Viewers, trust me, I was extremely overwhelmed with her achievements and resilience in making her limitations a stepping stone to greater heights. It was actually difficult to let go of her without inviting her to your program, The Platform. Today with my guest, we shall be discussing rising above limitations. Sit back as my guest introduces ourselves right after this short break. Thank you for joining us today, Ma, on the platform. And uh, may we please meet you? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Tilewa Amusu, Ola Tilewa Amusu, um, Ni Isaacs. I was born in Lagos some 60 years ago. Okay. Uh, went to school in Lagos. Okay, so before you go there, in fact, okay. that's actually my second <laughs> question to you. So okay. you grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. And for the sake of our viewers who don't know what was back in those days, what was growing up in Nigeria like? Well, I think like most people of my age group would say, growing up in Nigeria was fun. Mm, yeah. We all had, you know, it was like your mom's friend is like your mom's sister. You didn't even know who was friend mm. and who was sister. Everybody was auntie or mommy and you would treat them with the same kind of respect. And they would also, you know, scold and punish you if you did anything wrong. So between your house and wherever you were going, you are likely to have met so many people who would make sure that you are in check. Yeah. And um, even friends from school, you'll find that you tend to all grow up together, you visit one another, you all form a, a, a good um, network. And for me, it's nice because so many of my friends in primary and secondary school, thanking God also for technology, we're still in touch today. Wow. And we are able to know how is mommy doing, of course, quite a number of us have lost our parents, but, you know, Lagos was fun. Okay, so compare, okay, let, let's compare that time to now. What do you um, think? I different? feel a bit sorry for people in oh, this generation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> first of all, even when you interact with them, you find that sometimes young people feel they're not always real with themselves. Mm. People tend to like to form levels. Mm. You know, last week I was out with some of my friends. We tried to make that a habit. And that was one of the things we talked about, that, you know, when we all grew up, especially in secondary school, those who came from the highbrow secondary schools, those who came from the free primary schools, we all met and um, we formed a bond. But, you know, now everybody tends to like to form their levels and um, it doesn't seem to be so nice. Well, well maybe because it's the social media age, well, I guess, unfortunately, parents also have a fault because you know, now you would see parents going to their children's school to go and quarrel with the teachers or say, why did you do this to my child? I can't imagine that happening in my generation. Hmm. It is rough. The Lord will help us. So as a retired medical doctor and a retired major general in the army, can you please share with us a little about your early years? That's the first question because this, this is like a three-part question okay now why did you choose medicine or medicine as a career and the third part of it what motiv motivated the thought of joining the nigerian army okay so my early years i went to primary school in lagos um then it was called army children's school and barracks mm -hmm. now changed to command children's school I was actually one of the first students in the school, or first pupils in the school, when it started in 1966. And from then I went to Methodist Girls High School, okay. Yaba. But after that, I went far, far away. I went to the Federal School of Arts and Science in Mubi. That was then in Gongola State, now okay, in Adamawa State. Oh, yeah. Yes. So I went there and from there to the University of Jos. 
um, I guess some of those things actually formed my decision to do medicine, which was actually taking some time in primary school, but then, you know, you just think it's part of the fun. Mm. But by the time you get to secondary school, you want to be in the science class. Yes. Um, I wasn't one of those who felt I wanted to do engineering. I had felt, okay, I like the biology part, so I had already thought about medicine. So it was easy to transit to medicine from there. And why did I join the army? I guess, um, first of all, the fact that I already went to the Army Children's School for Primary. I had already been exposed to quite a bit of friends whose parents were in the army. Mm. And my mom actually was the head teacher who started the, the army schools okay. for the army. I mean, the schools, the primary schools for the army. So I guess that had already put me in that kind of environment. So when it was time to choose where I wanted to practice, I had to think I thought of a number of things. And first of all, I did think of a structured thing and something long term. I actually did apply to join the army. I applied to join the navy. I applied to join the police wow. at that time because I felt I wanted a uniformed service. Also because I was also adventurous. I wanted to be one of the few, you Female. know, females yeah. and see what it was going to be like. Um, and I think I did enjoy it. Why I joined the army eventually, truth is the army was quicker in its process of recruitment. Oh. And by the time the Navy and the police were coming up, I had already accepted to join the army. Yeah. And I have no regrets okay. joining the army. It's mm -hmm. of course the number one service. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ma. And that takes us to the next question. So as a woman in the army, and being in the midst of many male officers could, you know, be very, very challenging. So what do you say about discrimination and how did you surmount things while in service? Um, I do not say there is discrimination. Mm. But I say just like women in very many fields, you know, um, outside those that are traditionally seen as female, you have to work extra hard. You have to work extra hard because you have to prove that you are there because of what you can actually also deliver. You also have to combine a lot of other rules. But I think women are blessed. We're actually blessed with the ability to multitask. Yes. You know, I tell people, I said, if a woman is driving with her children in the car, you can be sure she's doing more than driving. She's doing so many other things. So it's the same way. So you have to multitask and you have to do so many other things to prove that you're there because yeah, you, you can. So I don't think it's discrimination. I think it's just adjusting your mind to know you have to work much harder than your male counterparts. If you're traveling, for instance, you're called a short notice, you have to travel. All your male counterpart has to do is call home. Okay, I'm traveling, make sure my bag is ready. They pick their bags. But you have to think, are they going to have enough food? How are the children going to get to school? Who is going to look after them? What if a child is ill? You know, and then apart from the immediate family, you also think about your mom, you think about your mother-in-law, you think about so many other things. So it's not always easy to be able to pack your bags as quickly as you can. But um, of course, the truth is you also develop your coping mechanisms. And like I often tell people, I said, we are lucky in Nigeria. I don't think it would have been easy for people outside Nigeria to get by with so many things. You can have a good support system which I had. I remember the first time I was posted out of Lagos. I had a daughter who was, my daughter was just one. And I was wondering how was I going to cope. But what happened? My mom was still working. She took her annual leave. So she came, stayed with me for the period of her annual leave. And then my sister took her annual leave, came and stayed with me for the period. My aunt took her oh, annual wow. leave. So for the first four months, I had people taking their leaves and coming and then i got a house help who was able to now see what i could do or at least i could train so i think it's just um you know that kind of attitude you have that support system and as we grow older among my friends we then had our own support system you know so you could help one another you know i've had people who were going on postings immediately and i said okay let your daughter come and stay with me so she can at least 
not miss school for now until you settle down. So we do have a number of support systems for one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. For so during service, childbearing and nurturing, because you, you, you already said something a little bit on that, but mm -hmm. we, we need to delve more on that. Childbearing and nurturing could be a limitation in some careers. For example, the military. You rose above such and uh, to raise two brilliant, wonderful children. So could you please share with us more how this worked? Okay, well, just like I said before, you know, you, you have to develop your own support system. And um, I was lucky to be able to do that. I had my family. I had friends and wherever I was, and I think I've also been lucky with staff. You know, I have some staff who have worked with me for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. I have, I still have my driver who was taking my children to school. And like you said in the intro, I'm a grandmother. So you can imagine if I have a staff that has been working with me, wow. if I have staff who have worked with me through all those times. Yeah. So I think they have also contributed to making things easy for me. I spent six months in Somalia mm. um, when my children were still small. I had to because it's the military. Mm. And um, I also had the support. At that time, my mother-in-law was alive. And in fact, she just accepted that, okay, she'll come and stay in the house. She'll be there with me. And, you know, such little things help you to work well but like i usually tell people i said if you want to be able to get benefits you should also be willing to help and give people so i think you know i also make it a it's part of me to actually also pay forward some of those things that yes people would have difficulties what yes. can you also do to help them knowing that when you need help you'll be able to also Both give it, yes. Because as women, you have to be able to balance both. If you want to have a good career, and like I tell people, if a woman wants to be happy, or if she's going to be happy, mm -hmm. she needs to be able to enjoy herself as a person, not just as a mother. As a mother. So you must be able to also attain those things that would make you happy and mm -hmm. successful, as well as being a successful mother. So. I'm not cutting short people who choose to be homemakers and just sit at home, mm. but I also feel that the woman who wants to have a career should be able to be given the benefits to see how she can, you know, manage mm. both. So I think that's um, what I would advise. Mm. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll quickly ask this question. While in the Nigerian army, okay, was there anything like favoritism for the female officers against the male or male against the, the women? Okay. Um, I wouldn't say there was favoritism against male or female. Of course. But in terms of it being a gender thing, mm -hmm. not in Nigerian army, to what I know, because I wouldn't say as a female I was favored or, you know, oh, no above the men okay. i wouldn't say so and well if you say the men have more opportunities of course we also know that the army has more males in decision making processes mm -hmm. but one thing i know that um i also try to make sure at least as a, for many years i was the most senior female in the nigerian army was to make sure that they had a voice at the table mm -hmm. so wherever there was a need for a decision to be made you would also choose that look consider us and look at it from our own view so don't um, like they say don't shave our head in our absence mm -hmm. make sure that we're also part of what is happening so i think um i wouldn't say there was favoritism but because they are in the majority because sometimes they used to be the only voice at the table so they might be able to push some things without considering the female thank you very much Mike. so Vera, we will be right back after this short break, don't go away. Are you a lover of African foods? If yes, then 
don't look too far away. African Foodway Market is the solution. They offer for sale different kinds of African food like gari, ilubo, lafu, semo, crayfish, dried fish and so on. Also, you can find Bangladesh, Indian, Caribbean groceries, halal meats, imported foods and many more. They are located at 1A282 St. Anne's Road, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Telephone 204-253-4455 or at 1741 Pempina, Winnipeg, Manitoba 204-261-4222 African Foodways Market Meeting your daily food needs Welcome back viewers and this is still your program, The Platform. And if you are just joining us, the topic for today is rising above limitations. And I have with me in the house, retired Major General Olatiliwa Amosu. Thank you very much, man. Thank and you. Uh, the first question that I'm going to ask you on this second segment is that um, let's go back to your role as a military officer. And in the, within the African context, many will say it is very difficult for a woman to rise to the position of a general in the army. How true is this? And how were you able to rise above this? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, I, I tell people, I said, it is difficult for anybody, mm. male or female, to rise to the rank of major general or to general because, you know, the army or most professions will start, it's like um, a pyramid. You have more people down and as you go to the top, it tapers. So it's um, not as easy for the men. It's the same thing. Mm. And for the women, like I said, probably because we're fewer in number, you know, um, the females in the army used to be between 6 and 10%. Yeah. So if you have that number, you can be sure that um, you have fewer of them also getting to the top. And um, the professions that we do, you know, sometimes the times that we join, the army has a lot of rules. Mm -hmm. Some have to do with your qualifications, some have to do with your age. I was about so, that. I've seen that. Yes. So your age, your qualifications will make a difference to how you can get to the 
you know, yeah. to the next higher rank. Mm. So I think um, I was blessed, I was favored, and I also worked hard. I do know I worked hard. Mm. Um, did all my relevant courses and made sure I did them well. Mm. Uh, those things actually put me in good stead to eventually um, reach the peak. So I actually was the second. Mm. Actually, even as at now, we have had only two females get to the rank of Major General in Nigerian Army. Wow. Um, I think we have had another two in the Navy so far. Um, we're looking forward to having more, but we're lucky we've had quite a number of one-star generals as well, mm -hmm. at least in the last um, six, five to six years. So okay, that's okay. also a we, plus. We, may I say that the competition is fair or something like that? Well, yes, to an extent, mm -hmm. um, I would say it is yeah. because um, there is no discrimination of rank based on gender. gender. No, mm -hmm. no, not based on gender. So, so it it, it basically means. What you can bring to the table, what you yes, have, and what, what you, you yes, table. what you have, yeah. and truly the army has expanded. Now we have females in many more, many more positions, and they are able to grow, you know, shoulder to shoulder with their male okay. counterparts. Yeah. So I think I envisage that um, in the next ten years, we would even have more females in very strategic positions. Okay, that will be so, proud of. So when it comes to one's qualification in the Nigerian army. Okay. Do you have to do the examination yourself or you need to take approvals or after doing it because, you know, it's different policies for different sectors. Now, you're, you're a medical doctor. I know within the medical sector, there are still some things that you have to do to move and move and move and move, you know. Do you have to take approvals? Or you can go you do them within your own power and then present your certificates to them. Or you have to carry your, you know, I, I know. let's just have a broad view. Okay, of, well, of um, for the military, you have courses. Aside from your profession, whatever mm. it is that you're advancing in your own profession, right. for instance, as a medical doctor, you also have military courses mm. that you must do okay. and do well. Um, those courses you are graded and you have to be able to attend them. Okay. The ministry doesn't take it lightly if you are asked to go on a course and you start giving an excuse, I want to do this, I want to do that, or I can't go for this course. So when you go for your courses and you do well in those courses, they're of part of the appraisal mm. that um, when you are due for promotion, because the army does not give promotions arbitrarily, mm. usually. So you have to be due for the promotion and then you are considered if you have met all the milestones expected between, you know, the five years that you're due for your next promotion, then of course, and if there is a vacancy, the because apply. the military also knows that, well, we can have this number of generals at a time, this number of colonels. No, you don't apply. Okay. You're just, it's, it's, ha you have like, the appraisal. Like yes. Up. So you do go for the examination. You also have to go for an exam. Okay. There is a promotion exam you should go for, and then based okay. on the results. Okay, now, I'm going to ask another question in line to that. So, if five generals goes for a promotion examination, mm -hmm. and everybody passes at the same time, will everyone be moved, or there are some other yardstick that will still be used to still, you know, how does that happen? Well, there are other yardstick, because you have to look at what's the vacancy. Okay. Can the army take five more generals at this point? Mm. You know, because you need to be able to place people. You can't promote generals and then you say they have to stay and keep doing the office work of a colonel. Or, mm. So you have to make sure that the space for them is available. Mm -hmm. So that is looked at. And then, you know, actually, as you get to certain levels, you also now need to look at um, the distribution. Mm. You look at in terms of um, the geopolitical distribution, mm -hmm. because those are things that matter in Nigeria. So they look at some of those conditions and then, you know, are able to select, yes. Okay. So, on that part, I won't say the last question. Mm -hmm. I don't think ask something else. Okay. okay. So, what age is, I won't say required, because I know we can do anything at any time, but if you want to advise, what 
level because we are not sure if we have some of our viewers out there, you know, considering joining the army or looking forward to having their children join the army. So what age would you recommend that someone joins the army? And with what, well, let me just say, maybe, I would say the minimum uh, qualification, you know, so that we can let people know that they can actually rise above limitations. Well, um, joining the army, there are different ways of joining the army. Um, people can join with the school sets. Okay. Um, that's the minimum qualification to join. So joining with school certs, they also have different um, two options. Mm -hmm. They can join through what we call the regular intake, which means they're joining as soldiers, mm -hmm. and then they have to go for training in the Nigerian Army Depot in Zaria, and then they have to rise through the ranks, private, lance corporal, and go on. Um, then they also could join with their school sets, jump through NDA. Okay. And then NDA is now like a university. Mm -hmm. And when they come out of the university, they are commissioned as officers as mm -hmm. well as part of their graduation. So then the third way is also for people who have already gone to the university, okay. done their NYSC, then they can join as um, short service commission. They are commissioned as officers. And when they're commissioned as officers, then they are posted to the court that meets their professions and then they rise yes, through the yes. officer corps. Okay. Now, for those who join as private soldiers, they also have the opportunity to go to school in the army. Okay. The army has a lot of schools on its own wow. that are equivalent to polytechnic um, oh. and are approved. So they can go there, they get those qualifications. From there, they can continue their job. Some of them, even from there, can be eligible to be commissioned as officers. Oh. So the Army actually has a whole um, professional career that within is available that. within them. Oh, wow. But then the Army takes people when they are young. Okay, like me now. Yes, when you're very young. So I, I'm, I, sure. I, I'm actually considering it yes, already now. You know, because, Maybe um, be obviously, I know that you are less than 30, so you have a lot of <laughs> opportunities to join. You know? Well, I'm actually <laughs> considering it right now. Maybe I'll be the um, sixth woman. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, so you should, do, you should always aim for the highest. You know, okay, but I said the army true. takes people when they're very young, and that's because you need to be young to be physically able to do a lot of the things that are done. You need to be young for the army to be able to mold you. Hmm. Okay, maybe remold. Well, no, because you see, the army will mold people. Hmm. That's why they won't take people who are very old, hmm. because they want you when you are still growing, and then they can. Shaking make you the into the way they expected. want you to be yeah yeah because even the little one that you have first they might have to break a bit of it down mm. but they want people who are young you know so that's why it's difficult for people who are old to actually join the army okay hi everyone so at this point i'm going to tell you that if you need any advice on joining the army i'm going to leave my details after this program and i'm also considering it anyway let's see if i can still bend down Thank you very much. So thank you, Ma, for that wonderful insight into how it works in the Nigerian Army. So can you please share with us one of the challenges you had while serving as a medical doctor in the Nigerian Army? Okay. That's the first part. How were you able to rise above these challenges? And the third part, what were the lessons learned? Hmm. Okay. Um... I don't know. I'm wondering which challenge I should actually use as an example. But the one that I like to the one I like to let people know is just to kind of it shows that you know things change and mm -hmm. there always have opportunities for improvement that we should be able to take yes. advantage of. In 1994, I went to Somalia. Unfortunately, with all the effort the United Nations put into Somalia, the war is still on, the country is still in disarray. And um, I was the only female in the Nigerian contingent, which had about 800 plus wow. um, 
people. Mm. Um, the and only female? The only female. Wow. Because then it wasn't common for us to send females you know, on peacekeeping missions. Yeah. Now it's, you know, that part of the progress that has been made. And the United Nations to make sure women participate more in peacekeeping yeah. operations. Now, getting there, yeah. I found that the Australians, the Americans, the New Zealanders, the Canadians already had females in their contingent. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, they didn't have big contingents, but they had females and they made sure that these females were properly quartered and um, whatever needed to be done was done. But I was the only female mm. going from Nigeria mm -hmm. and I got there and unfortunately, you know, they had only given Nigeria a kind of dormitory accommodation, we used to call it Nigeria House, which had no provision mm. for females. So getting there in the evening, there was nothing else to do. I had to stay in the dormitory. But then the gentlemen officers I stayed with were real gentlemen. Initially gave me a room, or gave me the space at the end of the room. And for the first two weeks plus that I stayed with them, they were true gentlemen. You know, they would make sure in the morning I would also make sure I woke up earlier to be able to have my bath first. If I found that I was tired, I didn't wake up on time, I just stayed on my bed, made sure they are all done, and then I had my bath. And some of those officers still today are some of the closest friends that I have. Oh, wow. You know, and for me, it was an experience to actually interact with a lot of them. And... Um, truly gave me the opportunity and I am able to defend mm. my colleagues in the military because that was actually a group of Army, Air Force and Navy that truly when they say gentlemen officers, mm -hmm. they truly are mm. gentlemen officers. They are also molded to be gentlemen officers. But then going forward, what has happened? We've had more women going on peacekeeping. But then eventually, yes, one thing they did was to also make a lot of case. Yes, we have a female in our contingent. She must be well accommodated. You know, so they were able to fight and were able to get um, a space in what we call the, um, where the, actually the head of the unit, the first commander himself mm -hmm. was actually staying. So they had a bit of accommodation there the and they gave me oh, okay. my okay. own space, which was also near where the um, New Zealand people were staying. So, you know, you find that now they're able to know in advance that when a female is going you must make sure there's accommodation but even beyond that now we have a lot of females going on peacekeeping missions with contingents so i mean we have actually developed significantly and that makes me proud okay so this experience were you able to lend your voice for that situation to change to add more women going on peace, skipping, and then make provisions for them? Yeah. You see, the fact is, quite a number of things. Mm -hmm. I ended up being, okay, let's try and see if she's going to be able to, let's okay. see if she can do, if it. She can do it. And okay. if you don't do it, you know, chances are that, oh, you know, these women, they can't they can. okay. do it. So don't bother sending a oh, woman. Okay. Um, there was a course I went for, and as I got to the course, they said, ah, is it a woman that medical had to be able to send? <laughs> and I just smiled. And okay. um, by the time we finished the course, you, you know, you I showed them. Yes. Even some of my course mates today, we say, don't try her. She will show you. <laughs> and, you know, the beauty of it is that now they make sure that there is now that deliberate policy to make sure that a female is sent on that mm -hmm. course. And now it's even automatic because we have females even in other course, combatant calls and all that. You know, but sometimes the challenge is if a female is put there and doesn't do well, you end up putting a ceiling for other females. So I always tell the younger ones that when you have an opportunity to go for a program, to go for a course, or even a meeting, make sure you do you it well. Yes, yes, make sure you do it well because it's not just for you. 
Otherwise, you shut the door about against other mm. females who would have otherwise done very well in that mm -hmm. position. Okay, so on on a lighter note, were you taught how to to, to carry a gun? I'm a soldier. <laughs> I'm I a soldier. <laughs> I'm just wondering, in my so she can okay. Let's just leave that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pat. So you are a great inspiration, at least to me. I know that for young adults, particularly the ladies. Do you have anything to tell them about life and making the right choices in anything? Well, um, yes. I tell young people, and it's very true for females especially, that look, the truth is life is tough. Mm. You know, very often, you know, young people will assume that, ah, you know, they'll even tell you, yeah, your time, things were easy. Mm. Even in our times, things were tough. Life is tough. You're not supposed to, if life was not tough and you didn't have to chew, mm. we wouldn't have teeth. Mm. You know, we'd mm. only be taking ice cream and we'll have our gums and that would be okay. Mm. But because you have to chew some things, you have to masticate, your jaw muscles are, mm. you know, trained to be hard. So life is truly tough. So females especially have to be prepared, you know, to go the extra mile because you want to be able to juggle so many, so many. things together. And you can do it. You know, there's so many people who have done it ahead of us. There's so many people who are doing it now in so many fields. And there's nothing stopping females from, you know, going further. There's nothing stopping young people. Um, I tell people, yes, in as much as I try to say, let's work on females doing well. Right now, I worry because we're talking a lot about females and we're leaving the young men behind. Mm. And yet you do have a society that must be even. Mm. If you have strong women okay. and you don't have strong men, then now we're going to start talking about gender inclusiveness for males. Mm. And that is going to also, you know, tilt the society. Mm. So for young people, we should take them as a group. We should look at how to nurture, you know. You have the good women. If you don't have the young men who are good, they won't have good husbands. So we have to look at everybody together. Let everybody walk towards, you know, Make you just know that life is tough, so you have to be ready to take some of those tough decisions. And when you have to make a tough decision, first of all, for me, works for me, everybody has the way it works. The first thing I do is to go on my knees and then I ask God for direction. He might give me the direction as, an, as a direct answer, He might give me as an illumination. Mm -hmm. You know, my sisters knew me growing up and they still tease me about it that. I work best in the night. Mm, yes. You know, I work <laughs> best in the night. So I might be awake till about three, four. And those are the times that I will just find that, oh, why don't you do things this way? Sometimes it's a direct voice. Sometimes it's somebody who would bring up an idea and say, oh, you know, this thing would have worked better. Why don't you look at it this way? So I think um, that's one thing that helps. And then I consult. I've been blessed. I have a good group of family and friends that have always provided advice, support. But like I tell people, when you take an when you when somebody advises you and you follow the advice, you cannot go back and quarrel it with that person. Decision. Because it was just advice. The yes. person did not put it exactly in a gun to your head and say you must follow must this. Yeah. So take it as well, I made a mistake this way. Retrace correct and go back and address it yes thank you very much Ma. and maybe i can just say that our young people need to have this hard skin they should understand that life is not bread and butter no. because uncle whoever is giving you money at a time and he stops <laughs> doesn't mean that he hates you yeah. it is just about life and whoever that wants to make it in life must be resilient yeah, must be ready to know is that terrible how do that all you are just after is that goal until you achieve it there's mm -hmm. no relenting thank you very much thank for you. sharing that thought with us thank you so much so let's quickly talk about your community responsibilities on a lighter note and limitations <laughs> you are a methodist girls or students um, association president and this show comes with some expectations possibly limitations so do you mind sharing this with us and how you have been able to cope with all of them Okay, well, yes, I do have, you know, now 
like I was told a few days ago, I seem to be very busy and yet I, I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> and um, the answer I gave is the same answer, you know, that yes, I'm retired from formal structured work in the army, but I'm busy doing a lot of things that I like to do, and many of it are community engagements. Um, one of the priority ones I'm doing right now is I'm the president of the Methodist Girls High School Yaba Old Girls Association. Um, MGHS, I'm sure there are a lot of old girls, old girls. listening everywhere. <laughs> and um, it's the oldest girls school in Nigeria. Wow. Yes. Um, how old are they? Oh, how um, formed in 1879. Okay. The school was founded in 1879. Okay. So we're 152 this year. Wow. And the school has been, well, we've been good. We've been up to up to par everything we have to do but right now i am quite engaged with the old girls association because we are putting up a 500 million naira building for the school okay and you're the as one a give back that. yes wow. um That's so huge. it's a big big give back um but we have tried we're about 50 percent mark we started last year and um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so that actually is a lot. I mean, the fundraising, the making sure other landmarks are met keeps me very occupied. And um, also making sure we give back to the school in different ways. You know, we have to support the girls, make sure the, you know, traditions of the school are kept. So those so many things. Um, but it gives me joy, you know, anything that makes me work with young people actually gives me a lot of joy you know then in the church yes i'm also doing a lot for the young people in the church that's my church st paul's anglican church Iduro. our church <laughs> st paul's anglican church Iduro. so we're also doing a lot for young people there um also in our diocese the diocese of lagos mainland and i have a few groups of friends that we do things together um there's actually also um, a group that I'm a board member, which is a Center for Sustainable um, Health in Africa. And we work a lot and do a lot of things to support health initiatives. So it keeps me busy and I think um, keeps my brain functioning so that I don't start to feel too tired. So. It's fun. Okay, I, I, I guess that answers that person's question. <laughs> yes. You. What I'm doing? Yeah, why? You how come I'm so busy? So busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Mark. So, I think this might be actually the last question for today. So, there is a saying that when life throws you lemons, make a lemonade out of it. Mm -hmm. And limitations are inevitable in the journey of life. So what strategies will you recommend to our viewers to rise above limitations? Well, first of all, everyone must have a resilience built into them. You know, I actually gave a talk to young people about two months ago on resilience. Mm -hmm. And that's because, you know, it's so easy for people to give up. Mm -hmm. You know, eh, we tried this one, it didn't work. Uh, I have this job, I don't like it, uh, but I have to, you know, you just have to know that even those people who got to the top didn't get there by, you know, having it all easy. You have to try, you have to fall and get up again. You know, you find that this thing doesn't work. Seek counsel from people who know can help you and get up and do it. Things will definitely be difficult. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you make your lemonade, enjoy it. Okay. You know, you can flavor it with whatever it is and even if you don't get any flavor take it and sip it and know that it's actually you know the lemonade that is yours you're not getting it from anybody so i think we should um, continue to encourage people let people become more resilient young people especially they need that resilience more even more than we did because all over the world globally now there are lots of things that are not as smooth and easy as it used to be but then life goes on so until end of time yeah. we still have to continue living we won't say oh because things are tough now you fall 
wipe your knees. If you need a band-aid, put the band-aid and continue working. Surround yourself with people who would encourage you. You know, when you have friends who would also feel despondent and tell you, ah, you know, this thing is too hard, let's give up. But when you have those who would push you and say, look, well, let's continue, let's continue. If this is difficult, let's try this method. You know, so the people you surround yourself with also would make a difference. And you should also make sure that you are also a positive influence to people as well so that, you know, you collectively would hold yourself up. Because those down times will definitely come. It will come now, it will come in the future, it keeps coming in cycles. That's the way of life. So when it comes, be ready to have people who would help to prop you up and who would encourage you so you don't, you know, feel down. So I think basically that's what, that would, have, that would be what I would recommend as um, a final, developing resilience, trusting God, uh, but trusting God, not trusting God to the extent that, okay, God is going to make breakfast and like, then you go and stand, um, like they say in the Yoruba poem, you stand near the tree and open your mouth and think everything will fall into it. You must be ready to work. God has given us implements, you use them. And also be, be a good friend and you would have good friends. Thank you very much, Ma. I, I actually liken it to when someone is going to take a race, all the sprinters. If you want to race on your mark set, now, there is a, a trophy or a set prize ahead, mm -hmm. which is what everybody should be looking up to. Just sure. like the Bible said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher Finish, of our yeah. faith. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean there are no challenges on the road to success. Yeah. But how are you able to, you know, rough it? And like, that is where I'm going. That you is must, the prize. That's that what is I'm what I'm for. just about. That doesn't mm. mean life wouldn't come with its challenges. Challenges, just like you said, is a constant part of life. And I think that is one of the reasons everybody needs, I mean, things everybody needs to understand. Challenges will, challenges will always come. <laughs> As you surmount this, another one is it's waiting. coming in front, yeah. As you surmount that, another, so it's just part of life. And it's not that somebody is doing me somewhere. <laughs> it is just life. And the Lord will help us all in Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Ma, for coming on the program today. And I know that I'm still going to come. This is not just like, okay, if I am going to still come back to bring you back on the platform. Okay. And we believe that some of our viewers are blessed to have you today as you have given insight into Nigerian Ami and part of your life. Thank you so much. Thank viewers, you very much. I will be right back after this short break. Well, viewers, the road to success is not without limitations. Rising above limitations requires consistency, dedication, and passion about what you do. You too can rise above limitations once you begin to live life with the right attitude. People who fail and fall are the people who see difficulties in every opportunity and call it an impossibility. But when you fail, try again, try more, and try a bit more until you get it. Always look out for opportunities in challenges. Remember that challenges are a constant part of life, unfortunately. I challenge you to rise above those limitations so you can begin to live a purposeful life. And this is where we draw the curtains on this episode of your program, The Platform. Until we come your way, same time, God willing, next month, together and in love, we can make the world a better place.